As the CEO of Chicago Public Schools and a board member of CASEL, I am extremely delighted to be here today and so happy that this conference is happening right here in my hometown of Chicago. As Mark stated in the introduction, Chicago is the third largest school district and we serve approximately 360,000 students. I would also like to echo the fact that a part of our vision is providing a high quality education for all of our students and preparing them for college career and civic life, which is really important and I think topical for what we're gonna be discussing today. CPS has a long standing commitment to SEL that was, was pointed out in the introduction. For the past 20 years, we've partnered with CASEL to implement evidence-based strategies in order to support and educate our students. But I have to be honest, and I've said this time and time again, as a lifelong educator in Chicago, I was actually converted to this SEL movement. So it's an honor to be uh, here today, not only representing the district, but also having a conversation about what SEL means and how critical it is for, demo for a democratic society. CPS is one of the original districts to join the Collaborative Districts Initiative, otherwise known as the CDI, where we were able to not only uh, collaborate with other school districts to implement best practices, but really has propelled CPS to be a national leader who champions SEL at all grade levels across all content areas in our district. Yeah. Yes, you should clap for that. Thank you. This work is led by a 30-member team, many of them are here today, uh, who represent the Office of Social Emotional Learning here in Chicago Public Schools. This team is made up of administrators, educators, support staff, and families who do this work every single day on behalf of our children. I'm happy to report that Chicago Public Schools continues to be supportive of SEO initiatives, even during some of our toughest times. At CPS, we work extremely hard to make sure we're providing a safe and supportive environment for all of our students, and the development of SEL skills is a critical component in that success. And we believe it's important not just in the classroom, but it's also important for our democracy, which we're going to talk a lot about today. Within our district, we have prioritized the importance of student voice, and you saw a little bit of that on display today as our wonderful students came to this stage doing something that is hard for me to do, and I'm a professional, I do this every day, but they came and spoke to over a thousand professionals like you sitting here in this audience to lift up important topics, and I think we should give them another round of applause. <laughs> through, through our partnership with Mikva Challenge, we have been able to uh, support and train many of our students so that their voices can be lifted up and that the issues that matter most of them are heard by adults. In CPS, we have student voice committees in almost every high school that we have across the city, and we also have uh, student voice committees in 45 of our middle schools. In addition to that, students participate in a student advisory council where they actually weigh in and make policy recommendations, real policy recommendations, not cutesy talks with, with senior leaders. They meet with the CEO, they meet with the mayor of this city, and they meet with other key decision makers uh, and commissioners who run certain offices throughout the city, and they are making an impact at an early age. Because in CPS, we don't believe that this is something that you teach in isolation in the classroom and then wait for students to apply it when they're old enough to vote or at some imaginary time once they complete high school. It is our job to give them a platform so that their voices can be heard, and it is our job to prepare them to participate in this democracy. So we're, yeah. What gives me great hope is that not just here in Chicago, but throughout our country, we continue to see powerful uh, examples of student activists, of students collaborating, community building, and lifting up issues that demand social change, which is critically important. This trend is a big part of the discussion that we're going to have here today with our uh, esteemed panel. I'd also like to say in a time of profound political and social division, how we define American values has vast implications on how we educate our students in the public school system. How we educate our young people to both view themselves as agents of social change while also taking into consideration the good of the greater society is a real pressing issue and it's also extremely complicated. To help us unpack that and understand that, we have a panel uh, today who will help us explore a few things. First, we're gonna talk about how SEL and this relationship-centered approach lays the foundation 
um, for our students to be both active participants in their communities, but also how it relates to us having a vibrant democracy. They will also point to ways in which SEL helps to prepare students and prepare this next generation to tackle what we characterize as a double barrel crisis of incivility and tribalism that is plaguing our country. Yeah, and finally, we want to point to other specific examples and ways in which that we can implement evidence-based SEL strategies in our schools so that we build both good intentions but also the skills that students need in order to be effective participants in civic life. So at this time, I would like to invite the esteemed panel to the stage, and I will transition um, uh, uh, to our chairs and give you more information about their backgrounds. Thank you. All right, um, first I'll start by doing a quick introduction of each of our panelists and then we'll just jump in uh, with specific questions and unpack the three objectives that were outlined earlier. First, I'll start to my far right with Dr. Lyndon, Linda Darling-Hammond, who is the president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, also the president of California's Board of Education, the Charles E. Ducommon Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University. Doc, whoo, she is a rock star. I have to admit, I was doing a little fangirling earlier, but trying to bring it back. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Darling Hammond also led President Obama's education transition team and has been called one of the most influential voices in public education and education policy today. Let's give Dr. Darling Hammond a round of applause. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Rick Hess, who is the director of the education policy studies, uh, director of education policy studies at American Enterprise Institute. He is the author of Letters to a Young Education Reformer and the Same Thing Over and Over. He also pens Education Week's, uh, Rick, Education Week's blog entitled Rick Hess Straight Up. And he also teaches a little bit on the side at the university. He's taught at University of Pennsylvania and also Harvard. Let's give him a big warm welcome. Finally, it's my honor to introduce Congressman Tim Ryan, who represents the 13th Congressional District in Ohio and has done so for the past 16 years. We also know that he's running to be the Democratic nominee for the President of the United States. He is. Yeah, we should clap for that. A good one. <laughs> he is a social and emotional learning advocate and has been before it was cool to be. Um, and he has introduced multiple bills supporting SEL in Congress and has made SEL a cornerstone of his $50 billion, and that's billion with the B, education platform. Let's give Congressman Ryan a big round of applause. So the first round of questions I'll start um, and kind of direct them to, to you based on um, things you've talked about or, or you know, things that you like to highlight and lift up. But I also want to encourage folks to jump in if there are other uh, points that people want to piggyback on or, or lift up. Um, we'll start with Dr. Darling Hammond. Um, first, I want to share two quotes that, uh, that really stuck out to me. On occasion, you've said that social emotional learning and the development of social responsibility are critical to the survival of both individuals as well as entire societies. A second quote uh, I want to lift up, you said, we need to recognize that educating the whole child is essential to the human race. When I hear those two quotes, I hear you drawing a direct line between SEL and the survival, our survival as a species, let alone a democratic nation. Can you please set the stage for this conversation today and just expound on that perspective? Sure. Um, I mean, if you just look around us, you know, in our own uh, societies, our communities uh, in the United States, but also worldwide, um, the biggest challenges we face are our inability to manage conflict uh, peaceably, to collaborate in ways that, uh, you know, both create and share uh, what is needed by people around the world, to deal with the huge crises of uh, the environment, of you know, the distribution of food and water, uh, all of those things require social emotional learning uh, at the level of individuals, families, communities, and societies. We've got to have people able to collaborate to solve problems. We've got to have people who have uh, empathize 
uh, with one another. We've got to have conflict resolution skills uh, and strategies that are commonplace. Uh, and it's not just a matter, I mean, it, I don't mean to minimize this, we do want to be nice to one another. We want our kids to be respectful. We want to have uh, empathy between human beings in the uh, classroom and in the school. But we really need this kind of work and learning for the survival of the species at this point. Yeah, I think you make a really good point about the fact that this is not just survival uh, of the species, but just our entire democracy. And I know throughout this conversation, we'll be having some conversations about what that means given the kind of political climate that we're living through right now. I wanna um, shift to Congressman Ryan, um, who has been campaigning for the past uh, few months and really talking to hundreds, if not thousands of parents, um, teachers, uh, young people across this country, and really get kind of that on the ground perspective about what you may be hearing um, from folks on the ground. The one thing that um, uh, folks in here, I think would be curious to know is whether or not you think, uh, in your experience as you've toured across the country, if you think pe individuals' uh, perspective about uh, social emotional learning varies based on their political affiliation. Um, I think people would make, would argue that people are divided on the issue of how we educate students, the role of SEL, et cetera. Are you seeing those differences and what, what would you share with this group that we should take into consideration? Not, not on social emotional learning, which I think is why there's 1,500 people here and we won't ask if you're Democrat or Republican yeah. or conservative or libertarian. I think you're here because you know it's working and it works and you've seen it. Uh, the, the tech, techniques reveal the, that kind of success and help the kids, and I really haven't. I mean, it's not like the old um, voucher discussion mm -hmm. from, from years ago. Yeah. Um, it's much more uh, unified, mm -hmm. and I think it's unified because in, in a lot of ways we're bottoming out. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing opiate epidemics, methamphetamine, deaths of despair, yeah. adverse childhood experiences, all the things that this is meant to solve, and we went a while with trying to deal with that without really having something to help us deal with it. Exactly. And now this has entered uh, the fray and I think it's, it's being pretty well received. I still think, as we all do, and from the dinner last night, we've got a lot of work to do because Absolutely. there's a lot of people that don't even know what we're talking about. Yeah. And, and that's the work of this conference and that's the work of all of us is to try to, and, and I think if we can do it in a way that's that's bipartisan. I mean, one of the best responses I get on the campaign stump is when I'm talking about social and emotional learning, mm -hmm. trauma-informed care, how we deal with our kids, and I say, American Enterprise Institute, Brookings Institute, this is actually something that is transformational. Absolutely. And we actually may be able to do it. And I think that gives some people yeah. hope considering everything else we're talking about. Well, as a lifelong educator, I can tell you it's encouraging when we feel like, you know, there's something that we can do that's actually going to change outcomes. So happy to hear that. Um, while, while I hear you saying it's not polarizing, I do think that when we think about SEL and its role in public education, we do still find people who run across the continuum. And so I want to ask Dr. Hess to kind of jump in because I know um, this is something you spend a lot of time talking about. And in fact, in an article co-authored by Chester Finn earlier this year, you cautioned the SEL field not to play into the kind of squishy leanings, if you will, um, but to intentionally and energetically connect SEL with more traditional conservative language around character formation and preparation to be responsible, preparation for responsible citizen, citizenship. Specifically in that article, you lifted up three values, virtue, integrity, and empathy as obvious components that, be, that should be included in any SEL programming and these things need to be much more elevated. Can you say a little bit more about the vulnerability of the SEL movement if we omit those three key uh, values? Yeah, well, gosh, I, I, you know. You didn't remember saying that? Well, no, I mean, I, 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 hope to, I, I hope to God, I hope to God that character formation and responsible citizenship are not conservative values. I mean, okay, that's okay. We didn't say that. Uh -huh. I, mean, I like to think part of the appeal of SEL and SEED to me, uh, Tim Shriver and I have written about this, is I think as a congressman says, there's a hunger out there. When mm -hmm. you talk to real people, uh, parents, teachers, who actually these things touch them on a daily basis, mm -hmm. 
they actually aren't all that excited by a lot of the fights that mm -hmm. take up social media. Yeah. Uh, they want have real children, they want to help. And the fact, the fact that it's considered noteworthy to note to recognize that children are fragile, mm -hmm. have real challenges, yeah. are real little people struggling with things and that that needs to be part of what happens in classroom and quarters, that this is noteworthy is remarkable. Yeah. It shows how far off the beam we managed to get um, when we tried to hold schools accountable and mm -hmm. hold teachers accountable and how far the teacher evaluation binge and NCLB took us from where we wanted to be. So normally, what I, when I talk about then the risks, so I think these values are incredible that these are where we can connect. Yeah. As Tim and I have written, I think there's a hunger and an appetite for this, and I think there's huge opportunity for us to walk, work across some of our devices. That said, normally I would like to talk about some of the lessons we might draw from small high schools or the teacher evaluation binge or values clarification, except that I gotta tell you, this partisan thing, I feel like I walked into a Democratic uh, National Convention rally. <laughs> um, we started with three speeches. I'm not sure those speeches r reflected the values that this room claims. When I hear about empathy, I would imagine that though as we talk about issues of immigration, empathy to me reflects incredible openness and warmth for the wonderful young person who stood up here and spoke mm -hmm. about her, which I get, yeah. and I appreciate and I value, but also recognition that this is a nation of laws, mm -hmm. that we have borders, that the folks who work for ICE are actually charged with fulfilling their constitutional duties under the law of the land. I did not hear the kind of openness to disagreement, to, 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 to competing values, the effort of empathy on all parties, mm -hmm. that to my mind, SEL is supposed to embody. Mm -hmm. What I heard were a series of partisan statements, mm -hmm. two of which mentioned uh, the president, a political actor, which doesn't seem to me to have anything with self-regulation, with emotional governance. Yeah. With, so I am wondering, and I heard, I heard woof whistles, I heard standing ovations, I gotta tell you, I think for conservatives who have real questions about whether this movement is really about these broad unifying virtues and values, or whether it is actually about agendas that feel more properly labeled ideological and partisan, mm -hmm. is to me sitting right here right now a very much an open question. Yeah. I think, um, I think the student piece and the student voice piece is critical. I think if we believe in the values of American democracy, which I think everybody's sharing this stage, no matter their political leanings would agree with, students' voices have been muted for so long. And so in CPS, we are unapologetic about the fact that no matter what they believe, we are going to empower them to speak their truth. And that doesn't mean that everything that a student says or that I say is endorsed 100%, but what is endorsed is your right to speak freely on all of those issues. And I'm incredibly proud of how our students do that every single day. And I think as a former social studies teacher, I tried to create those environments in my classroom. Um, this was before the teacher evaluation changed, so they said I was good. I'm not sure if that was the case. Um, but it was hard to do because I think for a lot of our students, schools have been set up in a way where they come in and we feed things to them and they're expected to make sense out of them. But I think nowadays kids are making their own sense and I think as adults and policy makers, decision makers, we have to figure out how we engage with this new normal because I'm telling you, I have a student advisory council and they say things that I disagree with every single day, but the fact that they say it to me is democracy and I think that's what this country is all about. Yeah. Um, Speaking of pedagogy and what we actually do in the classroom, I would like to bring Dr. Darling Hammond back into the conversation and say, how do we create classrooms and spaces where this type of pedagogy um, is common, where kids can um, both develop and cultivate their SEL skills while also having an opportunity to talk about some of these social political issues that are very meaningful to these kids. Um, I use my daughter who's 10 as an example. She is woke as the kids say. Um, <laughs> and the things that she's talking about at 10, I couldn't even imagine having interest in at that age. So how do we create classroom environments? What do educators need to be thinking about and doing in order to cultivate that kind of environment? Well, I think there's several things that uh, you're asking about. I mean, one are the set of pedagogies that, you know, create a classroom within which there is mutual respect, where there's empathy, where there's the um, opportunity to learn to collaborate effectively and so on, all of these kinds of social and emotional skills that also support perseverance and resilience and growth mindset, et cetera. 
Um, beyond that, um, there's sort of, uh, in, in one of the schools I worked with, we evaluated students in every course, in every grade, on personal and social responsibility. Mm -hmm. So where does the social responsibility yeah. come in? Uh, and I think that that's about taking responsibility and learning how to be a good, first of all, a mem good member of your group when you're collaborating on something, uh, but also a uh, contributing member of the classroom, a contributing member of the school around problem solving, but also of the community. So in some of the schools that um, I've worked with and seen really flourish uh, and where the kids have really flourished, they've taken on social responsibility in the context of the community as a whole around issues that are meaningful to kids. So certainly they're the issues in schools that you hear about yeah. from your advisory council, I'm quite sure. But there are also issues in the community that kids care about where they can think about how to make things better mm -hmm. for others. Yeah. What, what's the nature of this problem? What do I need to understand about it? Of course, as a social studies teacher, you've seen how you can get kids involved in all kinds of um, historical learning, geographical, you know, contexts, um, social science research, you know, data analysis as they look at problems to seek to solve them and then bring that in many cases to uh, a solution to the city council or mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, a strategy that can actually work in the community uh, uh, that can be done in any content area. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, uh, Understanding that it's one that beyond managing one's own emotions and being attentive and focused and persevering and resilient and all that, that the obligation to other people to help make their lives better um, is is empowering for young people. It creates a strong locus of control. It's very healing for kids who've experienced trauma mm -hmm. and adverse conditions, who experience discrimination, uh, implicit bias or explicit bias to know that you can take up a problem and work on it, yeah. use your academic skills as well as your skills of the heart um, to do something about it. So I think building social responsibility along with personal responsibility in the social emotional learning space is really important. And doing that in a way that in addition to the skills you might learn in a social emotional learning curriculum that are infused into the daily work of the classroom uh, is incredibly important in schools. Yeah. And, you, and you think about that in the context of getting that, in, the, cultivating that instinct that we can work together to solve small problems, whether it's in the school or in the neighborhood or going to see your local city council person or alderman, to the context of the broader culture today when you have so many millions of Americans who don't think they can do a damn thing to help everything that's going on right now. There's a, there's a level of helplessness, there's a level of hopelessness, and we talked last night about the small rudder turning yeah. the big rudder and mm -hmm. the big rudder turning the ship. Like, this is about creating yeah. and cultivating these kids who have these really massive challenges to deal with mm -hmm. around climate, around income inequality, around education, around, you know, pick it, pick yeah. the issue, deaths yeah. of despair. Um, the, the addiction, the mental health issues around the country. And so to give them a sense of em empowerment and mm -hmm. being empowered, I think is, is so fundamental to the long-term shift that we want to see in the country. Absolutely. Learning how to take empathy and turn it into solutions. Right? Exactly. Is, is a critical part of being a citizen. Yeah, a lot of the, the work that we've done here is really pushing on the action part. Um, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed a letter writing campaign season when they get to that point in the curriculum and my inbox is flooded with, you know, hundreds of letters from students across the, the district from all sorts of topics. But I also uh, wonder what we can do kind of daily in the classroom. And one piece that I know I personally enjoyed as a student and tried to cultivate as a uh, teacher is informed discourse in the classroom. So uh, Dr. Hess, you started to hit on this a little bit earlier with your comments about you know making sure there's space for opposing viewpoints and multiple viewpoints in order to fully understand an issue. Can you talk a little bit about what are some specific ways we can bring back informed discourse um, and in what ways can SEL, these SEL skills that we've talked about today kind of help uh, bolster that? Sure. Um, I mean, I think one is, 
every reform effort starts out with a sensible intuition. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's very easy as these things get translated into the public debate, they tend to get caricatured. So right, it's not like reason discourse has gone away. Mm -hmm. It's not what we see featured online. Yeah. It's not as evident. Um, I, I, you know, a long time ago, last century, I was a high school social studies teacher too. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, and we've all been in schools where we've seen go, uh, it unfolding exactly the way we'd love to see mm -hmm. it unfold. So yeah. what we're talking about is not rediscovering something that disappeared but we're talking about is fanning the flames of something we value and yeah. hold in common. I would say, look, um, and again, I, I, I remember, I mean, you all remember the same thing. 10 years ago, we would sit in these same rooms with the folks who were, who were designing the architecture of the Common Core. And everybody in those rooms was excited about it. Mm -hmm. And they said, this makes sense. Whether you live in Arkansas or Alaska, reading and math, thought, oh, look, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out that everybody in that room was nodding along and saying, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. And they would go to the American Education Research Association, everybody would nod along. And they would go to Grant Makers for Education, everybody would nod along. And they went ahead and they happily went about their business. And then it turned out like half the country wasn't on board. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that the, the rest of the country understood what they were trying to do in ways that were very different from the people who thought they knew what they were trying to do. So one caution here, is especially in thinking about how we're gonna bring discourse back to lots of communities and lots of states, which probably don't have anybody in this room, yeah. which certainly don't send anybody to AERA or Grant Makers for Education. Mm -hmm. I think you all, especially again, given what the zeitgeist to their last hour has felt <laughs> like to me, should be, I think, very uh, humble and very cognizant of where, uh, of the blind spots that you might not see because they're not in your social circle, they're not in your professional circle, but they're there nonetheless. So what, what can we do? Look, I, I think the principles say that uh, the Aspen Commission sketched are very good ones. Mm -hmm. uh, taking evidence seriously. Yeah. But I mean, I think that, that means taking evidence seriously when it comports with our hypotheses, but also when it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding that we have a long history uh, uh, over the last half century of boutique models and pioneering efforts looking really good but it turns out they look really good because you've got Professor Darling Hammond there mentoring along the way. <laughs> you've got funding for support. You've got um, a staff that opted in because, and it turns out that when you try to scale these things mm -hmm. and you don't have all those enabling conditions, it doesn't work as well as it, and then we say it was an implementation problem, but mm -hmm. that's too easy on us. Maybe it only works under hothouse conditions. So I think part of what we need to do is we're looking for models, looking for exemplars, thinking about what does it mean one, we've got to be very careful about learning from some of what we stumbled on. Yeah. And second, just what, what, one of the things that struck me um, as we talked about this for the last 25 minutes is there seems to be a blurry line between the skills and dispositions mm -hmm. that I think of as we can all agree on an SEL and kind of activism. Yeah. And one person's activism is somebody else's agenda. And I think if we're going to talk about what does it mean to get students engaged in social activism, that, I think, it, it, I, I'm not opposed to it. Mm -hmm. When I taught so high school social studies, I, was, I supported it. Mm -hmm. But I have a whole lot of questions about the way this frequently gets framed mm -hmm. um, when I'm talking to educators about what they're actually doing. That's a great point. I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, and go back to Congressman Ryan and just be a little bit more specific about what's actually happening in your congressional district in Ohio. Um, we know that there has been a, a loss of industrial jobs, for example, with plants and factories closing year after year, and this is something you, you know, contend with. What, uh, what are the ways you are helping your constituents better understand the connection between those realities and SEO in the schools, both to help students be more resilient, and, but also to develop agency so that they can advocate for the communities that they live in and to make those communities the communities that they deserve and that they want them to be. So really trying to bring, bring a connection between the skills that we're trying to highlight and elevate today and some of the issues that you face in your congressional district and how you see those two converging. Yeah, so I, my district is Northeast Ohio, Akron, Youngstown. It's halfway between Cleveland and Pittsburgh. Used to be old steel industry and rubber industry, and then it was auto. <laughs> Couple of Ohio people? <laughs> well, okay. Ohio people are absolutely obnoxious. <laughs> I speak as an obnoxious Ohioan, right? Am I wrong? Um, 
in the Cleveland Browns game, our biggest cheering section is called the Dog Pound. <laughs> oh, so that just good. explains everything you need to know about right. Ohio. Um, that the challenges there um, are so significant. I mean, you want to talk about adverse childhood experiences. One of those can be your parents lose their job. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, literally on the way here, we went to, uh, when we drove here and we went to Fort Wayne, uh, in Indiana, where the auto workers are on strike. And I was meeting people there who used to work in Youngstown, uh, but the plant closed. And, and so literally workers are driving two hours to work and two hours back home because they didn't want to move their families. And that's, the, that's like one of the best case scenarios. Uh, families having to move, people are sick, you lose your health insurance, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's kind of a bank shot in some ways to say we need social and emotional learning in the schools, mm -hmm. but it's, it's really a direct way of caring for these kids yeah. who are going through so much wow. and they don't, there's, they don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Daddy lost his job. My daughter called me one day, I was on an airplane and she was crying because her friend was crying because you know, wow. her dad lost his job. And you know, a month or two later, this gentleman has a stroke. Mm -hmm. I mean, because of the stress and the pressure. Mm -hmm. And that's just one example of what our kids you know, are living with. Yeah. And so having these tools that you're teaching these kids to not make the problems go away, and that, that's, you know, that's sometimes people try to portray this as, oh, you know, we're never gonna have any problems. No, we're still gonna have problems. We're still gonna have conflict. Yeah. But you're giving these kids the skills they need. So in Warren City Schools, which is here, we were able to get some money for them, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago yeah. to begin the social emotional learning program. Linda Lantieri came in and it's, it's going super strong. Steve Charo, the superintendent is here. Um, and they're dealing with these kids uh, because their dads and moms worked at the factory. Mm -hmm. And so to have this already established in the school district, we also have an opiate epidemic mm -hmm. in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So you can't make all these problems go away, but having those uh, opportunities there and then a lot of the student activism not activism uh, student advocacy yeah. councils and uh, student voices yeah. they're implementing that in the last year or two and that's really starting to take off so again now it's not to have a political discussion but it's just to say that in their world the economy globalization automation general unfairness why why is my family losing their jobs why is there this income inequality we want them to talk about that. Mm -hmm. and, and then, not that it's gonna make the problem go away, and it may start an argument with somebody in the, in the classroom, but that is how hopefully them learning that at that level can help us have a more mature discussion that doesn't look a lot like what's going on in the national media today. Yeah, one, one, yeah. <laughs> one thing I'll, I'll say just to kind of build on that, um, one of the things I think we learned in Chicago Public Schools when we started to really implement SEL with fidelity and kind of vigor is that it, it, we, we started with this place of how do we support students that have, you know, been exposed to certain, um, you know, adverse childhood trauma. But what we found is that every part of the city, people were kind of clamoring for this work and this support. And so um, it's really interesting to hear a specific example, but to also see how this kind of transcends, you know, uh, different backgrounds and communities and such. We're gonna transition, I think in a little while, I'm looking for whoever is in charge to take questions from the audience. We have a few minutes left um, and we're gonna jump into that. But before we do that, I would like to ask each uh, panelist to just tell me um, what gives you hope that we can really right this ship called American de democracy through embracing the importance of SEL development in our young people? So we've talked a lot about what this means, how it can go wrong, learning from other initiatives. But really, if you could just share what gives you hope, um, that would be, I think, nice, nice way to end. <laughs> and then we'll open it up to the firing squad. <laughs> uh, you know, I think there are lots of reasons for hope. I think one is that this is really spreading and I take Rick's uh, caution seriously yeah. that whenever we have you know, a reform that starts to spread, mm -hmm. uh, we have to be very careful about how we help people learn to engage in productive ways that are successful so that they don't get to the place where they say, well, we tried that and it didn't work because they got a little tiny dollop of it. But I'm hopeful uh, a, because it is spreading, because there is a felt need that um, is being 
uh, experienced by educators and kids and parents and families that it does cross uh, partisan lines. The, you know, the story that you told uh, about the families in Warren and Youngstown and Akron is one that you can tell anywhere you know, across many swaths of the country. Um, and you know, developing you know, the skills to manage those stresses, the capacity to feel empathy for one another, to just to give the supports that are needed, uh, everyone recognizes that that is really desperately needed right now. And I see huge amounts of progress. I work with um, a group of uh, organizations that support governors, chief state school officers, state board members, and legislators uh, across the country. And they're developing sort of a policy uh, set of strategies for whole child policy. Yeah. Uh, and states are, Republican and Democratic states, are interested in figuring out how to really enable and support this kind of work in schools for all right. kids. So I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic mm -hmm. uh, that we can figure out the implementation challenges mm -hmm. Um, and we do have to work on that uh, so that it, it does get to every school, to every child, to every community. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Um, first off, I'm famously not optimistic about anything. <laughs> I know. Dig deep. <laughs> Dig deep. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, af after we finish today, I will go back on my plane, I will go back in my bunker, and y'all can talk about <laughs> what a wet blanket on a helpful dipstick that guy no, was. No. You will not be the first. You may be the last. Well, you know, we can only see. Uh, but look, I, I, I mean, I'm optimistic about this because this makes sense to people. You talk to parents. You guys know this at least as well as I do. You talk to parents. You talk to teachers. Mm -hmm. Children are not little automatons yeah. learning, reading, and math. Yeah. They are fragile little people who are wrestling with emotions, mm -hmm. wrestling with frustration, wrestling with stuff that happens to their family and happening in the world. And it is crazy, it has always been crazy for us to talk about school improvement as if that was something we could set aside right. from right. teacher evaluation at school. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. um, See, they every, like, they like every once in a while I stumble into something <laughs> that doesn't annoy people. <laughs> so you guys Say that again, your, say that one more you time. You guys could tell your friends you were there uh, when Rick said something that wasn't so annoying. So <laughs> it, uh, special day. Uh, so, so I think, so, so that's why I'm optimistic, um, because this makes sense, because it meets a real need, because we've got a lot of really smart, thoughtful people yeah. um, who have been trying to do careful and thoughtful research on it, mm -hmm. who have been trying to pilot it in sites. Yeah. Um, and especially what I'm optimistic is when I talk to folks uh, like Tim or the congressman, and these are people who are absolutely aware of where these things go wrong. They talk about, look, what we're trying to do here is something that's not about larger, crazy agenda. So, so that said, I think if you study these things over a half century, and Linda and I have had this conversation more than <laughs> once, part of the problem is it doesn't matter what the leadership thinks they're doing. It doesn't matter what the people who believe in it think they're doing. What matters is what tens of millions of people, adults, teachers, parents out there think you're doing, whether it's what you're doing or not. Yeah. And a lot of their impression will be formed by the things that go viral on YouTube, mm -hmm. by examples of your work that they see crop up in their newsletters, by what gets reported about what you're doing on social media. And so it is not enough simply for an organization to be careful and disciplined yeah. about trying to make sure this actually is purple and broad and reaching. It's important that they actually be careful about who is being seen as speaking in their name mm -hmm. and what is representing the fruits of their work. And with that, I would say, look, I'm optimistic that this can make a big difference for our children and be a really good thing. I don't think there's anything, any, no one thing is going to either save or sink this country. There's 300 plus million of us struggling, disagreeing, wrestling with all kinds of issues and challenges and questions. And if you put that much weight on SEL, you're going to sink it. Mm -hmm. All SEL can do is do its part in our tapestry well. Yeah, it's a great point. <laughs> Congressman? Uh, two or three things I'm optimistic about. 
I'm the exact opposite. I'm completely happy optimistic about everything. about everything. I'm running for president. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, better, you better be optimistic yes, if you're going to do that. Yes, Just some advice for you and your careers. Um, in fact, there's maybe just slightly more people in here than there is in the Democratic debates that we're having. So, um, I think two or three things. One is it, what Tim Shriver did last night, asking everybody to get on their phones and contribute mm -hmm. to your point of, you know, this is not going to be a top-down thing. Tim wanted to make sure everybody gave a few bucks, even if it was, you know, five, um, to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's unique and special about this. You're seeing the crowds here, a 1,400-person wait list to get in here. This is, this is a really a, a grassroots uh, movement that's happening here. Um, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the, the bipartisan nature. We could have sat up here and had a big argument about what you said, and I disagreed with what yeah. you said, but I'm, I'm about focusing on what we agree on mm -hmm. because that's what the country needs. Yeah. And then lastly, I'll just tell you a quick story. When I was at, in Warren City Schools, they do a, um, in, in Linda's program, they do a project where they read the book Stella Luna. It was a few years back, so I don't remember all the details, but there's like a duck and a bat, or a bird and a bat, and they, you all know it better than I do, but they got the kids up and they did the Venn diagram on, on what they uh, had, what they were, how they were different, and what they had in common. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the technique was you'd get the kids together, and there was this little you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid, mm -hmm. and this young African-American girl, and they had to stand next to each other and tell you know, what did they have in common? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what were their differences? And they went through their differences. And then they went through, the one girl went through what they had in common. The little African-American girl was up last. And what do you have in common? She says, we both have eyes. We both have dark hair. And then she paused. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't think of the third thing. And she said, we're both human beings. Wow. That's a good point. And I just thought, that's the power of what we're talking about, recognizing that humanity. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Jackson, if you wouldn't mind, the first question comes um, from our audience talking about the MIGVA Challenge kids being great, right? Mm -hmm. And they're coming from Chicago Public Schools. Yeah. Um, and they're interested in who else is doing the work of linking SEL, civics, and democracy education as well. Well, MIGVA is our best partner, and they've, they've been in Chicago for a long time, and I would take up too much time if I told you the incredible history, but they are, the it's the most robust set of programming. They have all these um, committees and, and forums or tables that they create for kids to get involved. But if I could give a plug to our Office of Civic Engagement and Social Studies, we have actually embraced this as a district. So we help to lobby to make civics a graduation requirement with the state. Um, so it's a graduation requirement in CPS and now throughout the state of Illinois. And we've also reformatted, uh, thank you, we've reformatted our curriculum to go beyond kind of uh, civics that many of us experience, which is just understanding the executive branch and encouraging people to get registered to vote, but really just understanding there are all these ways to be engaged and to be active, and there are going to be some people who choose to do that in the streets through protests and other people who choose to work in spaces like this where they influence policy and letting kids know that there are a variety of places and on-ramps for them to get involved. So I would encourage folks to go on our website and look at some of the frameworks that we've put together. And then the last plug, and this isn't just CPS, but I think this is nationwide, um, is the role of debate. People who know me know I am a huge, huge fan of debate. And I think that as we think about the polarization that has been happening, I think debate is one of those tried and true skills where you force students to look at um, an issue through multiple lenses and viewpoints. And for the school leaders, uh, district leaders that are here today, if you don't have a strong debate program in your district, I would say that's probably one of the first steps that you could make in order to activate student voice and really cultivate those skills. Yeah, I wanted to add to that when you were talking about informed discourse, I was yeah. thinking about debate. Yeah. And it's really empathy and evidence coming yeah. together, it right? Is. You have to yeah. hear and feel the other point of view, and then you have to think about, exactly. about the evidence. Just to put a plug in for California as well, mm -hmm. we have a seal of civic engagement that is about to be part of the state um, uh, accountability and improvement system. And there are a lot of groups like um, Facing History in Ourselves, yes. uh, Expeditionary Learning, Center for Collaborative Education in um, uh, Massachusetts and others that are really engaging kids and you know sort of linking 
content, civics, democracy education, and social emotional learning skills. So um, there are probably hundreds of them, but everyone can find uh, a path. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, let's go to our next question. So this one says, politicians get elected by heightening our differences and creating an aversion to the quote unquote other. How do we reconcile that with core SEL values like empathy? Mm. So why don't we start with you, Congressman? Oh, that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say certainly some politicians do get elected by height, uh, heightening our differences and creating an aversion to the to other. Uh, and others get elected by running on some kind of unity mm -hmm. theme. And we're desperately in need, I think, of a, a unity themed message that can actually, because I, I, you know, I'm a little bit old school, but I think um, the rhetoric during a campaign should be a platform for what you're going to do when you get in. And, and so talking about, and I talk a lot about social emotional learning, as I said, I talk about how it has the support uh, in a bipartisan way. I talk about things like regenerative agriculture that has the support of Republican, libertarian, and liberal farmers. Liberal, aren't many liberal farmers, but there's a few out there. Um, but, but, you know, liberal Democrats who support what it can do to sequester carbon and do these other things. Talk a lot about uh, manufacturing of the future, electric vehicles, batteries, charging stations, wind, solar. Keep things around a theme that people agree on and that you can actually get past. And I don't think we're in that realm right now. We're talking about a lot of things that may sound good, but can't get 60 votes in the Senate. And so that's one strategy is the othering, uh, the shaming and all the rest. But the other theme is, you know, we can go to the moon and we can only do that if we come together. And that's why I think the next phase of the democracy has to be around what are these things that we agree on. We can spend all day on Twitter, all day on social media, talking about what we disagree on. What the hell do we agree on? And let's move forward on those things. Yeah. Thank you very much. David? So I kind of feel like a, a, the lottery girl when she says, the next ball is three. <laughs> we are waiting for the next question to come up. This is from Jordan Tinney. It says, why do you believe that SEL has become such a powerful movement right now? And how can we work to make sure that it sustains its momentum? Now, Dr. Hess, I know you've written a lot about this. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make you feel left out. I'm going to direct this question towards you. Sure. Um, I, I think SEL is doing well because everybody who had the ball fumbled it. Uh, NCLB pulled really well from about 2002 to 2004. <laughs> um, yeah. And then it started Before slide. it started to be implemented, right, yeah. Teacher That's evaluation really pulled wonderfully back in 08, 09. Uh, the Common Core early polling was actually remarkable. All of these, what's happened is basically, I think, uh, we have made uh, K-12 accountability uh, anything dealing with evaluation of teachers, uh, most things dealing with standards and curricula right now are poison uh, for policymakers, advocates, and funders. So they have been looking for something else that they can run with, and the things that have appealed to early childhood education, career and technical education, early college, and SEL. So there's this huge window of opportunity that has been created because everybody else screwed up. Uh, one of the ways to not put your name next to them in the graveyard is to make sure that you're learning from some of the places where they did so that this can maintain its momentum. Uh, f the first two things I would say is get, getting that going. One, like I mentioned, be incredibly careful of what's going out in your name. You can say those vendor materials are not actually aligned to what we're talking about, that that is not actually a model of what we have. But 99% of Americans have no idea what your thing really is. So whatever they see popping up and showing up on YouTube is what they think you will be about. The second thing is when you try to go fast, when you try to go big, you wind up making it really hard to do this stuff carefully and well, which means lots of people's experience with what you're doing is going to be shoddy and frustrating. So even though there's a temptation to seize the moment, you're generally better off on something like this where what matters is what happens for real children and real teachers and real classrooms is making sure you don't get ahead of yourself. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to add to that. Um, like, uh, do you want to go ahead? Go ahead. I do. Um, 
I think all of that is exactly right. And the three examples you gave at the beginning of things that got fumbled and failed were very top, were implemented in a really top down way with a lot of punitive consequences. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's amazing that, uh, and, and even though SEL right now is a grassroots movement, it's really much more bottom up, it is possible for this to get carried by someone who thinks that the way to do it is top down with punitive consequences. <laughs> because people bring whatever it is through the lens that they have. Uh, you know, and I've even heard stories about this mm -hmm. in some schools where they said, oh, we're going to do sell, and if you don't show self-regulation, we're going to, you know, punish you. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and so it's already yeah, become, it's been so put yeah. through that cheesecloth, and it comes out in another way. It's top down on the teachers, and now you'll hear, whenever this happens, you'll hear teachers say, oh, now we have to do X, right? But the X is not very well explained. The tools that you need to engage in it well are not there. The professional learning opportunities and the support systems. So uh, even though this, that would be antithetical for what we're talking about here, it can happen yeah. that way. And so I just want to reinforce that the way social emotional learning has to continue to move out into the field is with the supports, the you know, understanding, uh, the acceptance, the grassroots buy-in that allows it, and, and I'll tell you, even in California, where we've got a lot of this work going on, one of the things we're trying to do is reduce suspensions and expulsions in schools and replace that to a substantial extent with social emotional learning and restorative practices. But there are teachers who now feel like uh, they took away my suspensions mm -hmm. and they didn't replace it with anything supportive yeah. that enables me to work with kids. The time, the resources weren't put in place. So. Uh, just to really say we've got to figure out how to do this in a way that really is person to person that, and supportive. That's kind of why I think that it's, it's moving and growing the way it is. When we, when we started uh, the program in Warren, Ohio, Warren City Schools, um, you know, you couldn't do every teacher. So you did some and the, everyone got invited, but not everyone could get it quite implemented. And, and there were teachers who chose not to do it. And it was you know, the Congress, young hotshot congressman's bringing them a bunch of teachers, some new thing, right? You guys love that, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm from so, the government and I'm yeah, here to yeah, help. Yeah, I'm here to help you. <laughs> yeah, never been a teacher once in my life, but I'm going to tell you how to do this. And, and so we came, and some teachers didn't do it, and, and they forgot about it, and they started to notice the other, the classroom climate mm -hmm. of the other teachers. And they said, what, what are you doing in your classroom? And the teacher said, well, that was that thing, you know, Linda Lantieri and Tim Ryan brought it, and you remember you didn't want to do it? You didn't want to do this. <laughs> thing. And so it sold itself. Yeah. And I think being patient and, and letting it come, come from the bottom up, I think is going to be really critical. But that's the power behind it is the teacher is modeling it to the other teacher, and they're getting the results that the teacher not doing it wants. Yeah. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. This one says, what type of citizenship should we use SEL for? Active, voting and actively learning about politics, political issues, or transformative, working to bring change? Who wants to grab that one? I think the um, examples I gave were on the transformative side. It's like, what do we need as human beings in our classroom, school, community, um, and how can we understand that and with our empathy look to bring that kind of change. There's a political piece to that, but uh, I think uh, from the perspective of the humanity that we're talking about here, the working to bring change irrespective of uh, party or politics is, is got to be a big piece of it. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. All right, this is coming from Anonymous, who's been putting a lot of questions in. So <laughs> uh, we share the vision of a better world together. How can we, as a field, systemically advocate for social and emotional learning at the national and international levels? So I'm going to open that to whoever wants to respond. How can we systemically advocate at the national and international level? It's, You're doing that. So. Yeah, well, it's, it's good old-fashioned organizing. I mean, there's no easy way to do it. There's no, you know, I, there's no magic wand, there's no superstar, there's no savior. It's going to be, you know, knocking on doors and, you know, how, how was Castle able to get the first SEL standards in Illinois? Mm -hmm. You know, you just start 
networking. You just start moving the, moving the needle, and you do it where you are. So everybody in this room, there's 1,500 people here. You're all going to go back to your respective school districts. Um, you need to get organized. You need to, you need to get the parents that this has touched, the teachers that it has touched, the administrators that have seen the difference, that are trying to back it. Run somebody for school board. You know, I mean, I literally, I ran for state senate. Like, you can run a solid campaign in a local community for a local race with just 20 people that are just super motivated about an issue. One belongs to this church, one belongs to this church. One belongs to Rotary, one belongs to Kiwanis. One, you know, you pick 20 people who are, who are integrated into the community, you can move the needle in that community. And so don't try to change the world, you know? You have a politician say, think small, <laughs> you know, like, but get it done. And, and so I think um, that's how you do it. And then you'll have a bunch of school board people in your state that could talk to the state. Now you've got a network of people, so as you implement it, you always make mistakes. We were talking about this at, at lunch. You always make mistakes, so the, the key is to have a network already built so when you realize the ramifications of your decision that didn't quite go the way you, know, you wanted it to go, that you can immediately get back into the legislative process to fix the problem. But if you don't have that network from the school board and the schoolhouse to the state house, then you're going to miss the ability to change it. So that's how you do it, and it shouldn't be no different than anything else. You know, one, one useful insight here, too, because it's, it, 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 it's substantively important as well as helpful to ad, for, for y'all who want to advocate, is like one place where the Common Core folks tripped up, I, I've always believed, is they had very visible bipartisan support. They had a bunch of Republican ex-governors, some Republican governors. Jeb was out there all the time. Uh, but it always felt to conservatives like Jeb was the Common Core's ambassador to conservatism, not like he was the conservative's ambassador to the Common Core. And I think one of the problems when you're trying to build these community networks, so you get a couple of folks from both sides of the aisle in the community and they're running for school board, or they're up, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to feel to parents and folks in the community like this is being responsive to all their concerns. So for instance, when I was uh, taking a look at the Aspen Commission report and giving them some feedback, one of the interesting blind spots was there was simply no mention of communities of faith when they were talking about all the community partners to outreach to. They had all kinds of other groups, uh, which was good, uh, but there was this curious omission. There was just nothing around community, and I was, and I, when I brought it up, and when we did the conference calls around it, yeah. it wasn't purposeful. It was just that the people on this big 60-person steering committee and the folks charged with drafting and the folks who had read it, they're just not people who think about those communities in that, that part way. of the country. Yeah. So the examples that are getting flagged, the, th the kinds of outreach, the kinds of models that are being held up, again, are going to be taken as representative of what you think inclusive means. Mm -hmm. So being substantively inclusive is both good for making this work for all of those families and children and teachers out there, but also really important to building the coalitions that now, see, Congressman this, talking this about. This is the exact reason why you have a diversity of thought when you're putting this stuff together, because not having the faith-based communities involved is a huge mistake. And, and so... It didn't get flagged, but you know you got to have the diversity of thought, and we would disagree on seven things, but we agree on three. And just think of how, because here's the problem too with politics, which you all know, is that Democrats get in and it swings this way, and then two years later, the Republicans get in and it goes all the way back over there. When are we going to sustain something that we talked about, we cultivated together, and we included the faith-based community, so now we've got super, talk about a super wired network. Now you've got the Kiwanis, the Rotary, the faith-based community. Now you're really piecing this thing together. So when you pass it, it's sustainable, and it can actually get integrated into the community. And that's why all of us, I hope, when we leave here, practice the social and emotional skills outside of our schools and into the community and our political dialogue, model that for the kids, so that we can have a product at the end of the day, the old Myers-Briggs thing, you know, you make sure you have everybody at the table that has all the different personality types, and they'll drive you crazy, and it'll take you longer, and you, we'll, you'll drive them crazy, and they'll drive you crazy, but the product at the end is sustainable. And that's gonna be the key moving forward, because we don't have time to keep going back and forth. 